Hi folks again. So we're back again and now we're talking uh, still about network structure and so forth. We're going to talk a bit about what's known as homophily. And in terms of the overall outline of the course, we're still in the first part where we're talking about background and basic definitions and characteristics of networks, ways of, of representing networks, and uh, tying this in with some empirical background which gives us some feeling for what kinds of things are observed and not. And uh, in particular, um, today's subject is homophily. And what this refers to is the fact that when we, instead of just looking at the network without node attributes, we actually keep track of characteristics of nodes, we tend to find that linked nodes are similar to each other. So, um, you know, this is something that's been recognized in human uh, interactions uh, for millennia, and uh, in particular, um, here's a quote by uh, Philemon Holland from 1600, birds of a feather flock together, um, depending on your translation, or as commonly, uh, birds of a feather will fly together. Um, so similar types interacting with similar types. It's been looked at across a, a variety of, of different uh, dimensions, so age, race, gender, religion, profession, and uh, the term homophily itself <clears throat> was coined by Lazarsfeld and Merton in a 1954 paper. And um, <clears throat> it's really been documented across many different uh, studies. So, you know, studies of, of gender and ethnicity, um, profession, uh, and, uh, you know, grade and, and race and schools, a whole series of different attributes. And to give you just some feelings for this, uh, <clears throat> Peter Marsden's study, I'm looking at a national survey in the US, um, only 8% of people uh, actually named anybody of another race that they, with whom they would discuss important matters. Um, and that's much lower than you would expect if, if people were just naming people uh, with, without regards to race, so if it was uh, balanced in terms of what the population is. Um, interracial marriages in the U.S., uh, a study by Roland Fryer, 1% um, of, of whites uh, uh, marry outside of white, 5% uh, of blacks, 14% of Asians. The numbers are going to differ based on the size of the, of the subpopulations, um, but basically what you're seeing is less than what should be expected if these things were happening uniformly at random. Um, high school or uh, middle school friendships, um, less than 10% of a, uh, expected cross-race friendships is always an interesting one. Um, when you look at closest friends, 10% uh, of men name a woman, 32% um, of women name a man. Uh, so you've got some uh, uh, asymmetries there, but also, again, um, well below uh, what you should see at roughly 50% if, if there was not uh, any bias in, in that. Um, Here's a picture from <clears throat> a high school in the Ed Health data set again. Uh, this is from work I did with um, Sergio Cuarini and Paulo Pin. And what we're looking at here is a given high school. And uh, nodes are colored now by their um, uh, self-reported um, ethnicity. Um, so the blue nodes are blacks. The, uh, you can see it, there's a few red nodes. Um, which are Hispanics, um, the yellow nodes are um, whites. And what you begin to notice here, this was actually drawn by what's known as a spring algorithm. And the idea of a spring algorithm is you could think of, of links like springs. And imagine these springs trying to pull nodes together that are linked. So if I'm linked to a bunch of other things, then uh, those nodes, we try and collapse it. So a spring algorithm tries to relocate the nodes on the page in a way where nodes that are connected to each other are pulled closer to each other and um, without just collapsing everything to a giant uh, small ball. Um, so uh, you, you have to keep the, the, a certain spread of the nodes on the page and then when nodes are connected to each other, you try and move them closer together. And so what that does is it begins to uh, show you that there is um, a, a separation where most of the um, blacks are in, in one group, most of the whites are in another group. Um, here the Hispanics tend to be a little more integrated. Um, 
but uh, you see a, a strong segregation pattern. You can see that visually. If you begin to look at the numbers, you also see that in terms of, for instance, the whites make up 52% of the population, and yet 86% of their friendships are with other whites. Blacks make up 38% of the population, yet 85% of their friendships are with other blacks. So this is where you begin to see the uh, differences between what would be happening at random and what's actually happening in the, the data. And um, here, interestingly, Hispanics are, are somewhat outbred in the sense that they're 5% of the population, only 2% of their uh, friendships are with other um, Hispanics. Um, smaller groups will tend to have different uh, characteristics than larger groups. Um, but we're, we're seeing a, a strong uh, segregation pattern. Now, if we, um, what I did here is instead of just looking at people's uh, nominations of others as friends, so in the survey you could ask, you were asked to name up to five male and five female friends, and that uh, was what was pictured before. Instead, we can look at what people do in terms of activities. And uh, here, these are what are known as, uh, I put in quotes, strong friendships. So these are situations where people spent, did at least three activities with another individual in a given week. So you, for instance, studied together or had lunch together or um, you know, do, were in a class together or something. Um, so now uh, friendships are going to be um, stronger relationships um, because there's more of a, of a hurdle to be crossed. And the, the network ends up being sparser. And in particular here, when you look at this one, now you see um, even a stronger separation. So I think there's only a few um, links between uh, blacks and whites. I think, you, you know, you can see one here. Um, there's one here, uh, one here. There's, there's basically something like three relationships um, across. So depending on how you define friendships, um, you, you know, here when we put in a stronger definition, we see even more segregation and uh, fewer uh, cross-group relationships than before. Now, this is not something that's unique to American high schools. Um, this is a study by Bearvelt and all looking at a Dutch high school. Um, and uh, here you see, again, you know, the Dutch make up 65% of the population, 79% of their friendships are with other Dutch. 5% for Moroccans, 27% of their friendships are with other Moroccans. So again, when you look at uh, what's on this diagonal, the diagonals are basically larger than the fractions of the population. So you're seeing people have a higher tendency to be linked to their own type than uh, different types. Now, you know, when, when we begin to think about this, it's not, there's many explanations. And um, what we can talk more about this as the course goes along. But uh, it's not just one possible explanation. Um, it could be that there's opportunities, uh, you know, that, that somehow but the way in which the classes are structured and the possibilities that you meet people could be biased by race. And so it might be that who you contact um, is, is uh, race dependent. So that there's just more of a chance of meeting your own type. Um, it could be that there's benefits and costs. Um, so having a common uh, set of understandings or common culture, um, common language, in terms of uh, the way that you, you think about things um, could make it uh, different in terms of how people deal with things. There could be social pressures um, that are involved. Um, there could be social competition. There's a whole series of different uh, theories for why you might see homophily. But what's going to be important here is understanding that sometimes looking at a network, if we begin to put in characteristics, we'll begin to see that the structure of the network is characteristic dependent and the structure of things like homophily are going to be important in understanding, for instance, why um, learning might have, uh, uh, might have impediments in terms of a segregated network, or why communication might result in an idea of circulating among one group and not another group, or uh, understanding when it is that contagions will end up hitting a whole population as opposed to parts of a population. So understanding homophily structures is going to be important in understanding a whole series of things once we begin to understand what the structure of networks has to do with behavior. 
And it's interesting to understand homophily in its own right, you know, why are we seeing these patterns? What's really going on? Why, why do we see these kind of separations and segregations? So we'll get to that, uh, more of that as, as we go through the course.